people can see my slides. Um, it says that it's still disabled. Can I have that enabled for me, please? Okay, wait, we're working on. No problem. Hope everyone's having a good day. And uh, to all of you who may be um, affected by the current flooding in KL, I hope you all make it home safe if you all are watching this from somewhere else. Okay. Uh, okay. All right, I think I see it's working. Okay, great. You should be able to see the screen right now. Okay, um, is my screen visible? Just like to check. All right, fantastic. So uh, what I teach is called mobile journalism. Mobile journalism is the uh, way we can use our mobile devices, like our phones, tablets, iPads, and these kinds of things in order to capture stories. For me, as the journalist, I would capture news, but it's not necessarily news that you can capture. There's a lot of things that are not in the news that matter as well. So for a lot of us in journalism, when we go out, uh, our backpack is full of stuff. Like what is on the photo on the left? This is the kind of stuff that we bring along with us to our uh, sessions, to where we go and record stuff. It's a lot of things. We've got a laptop, we've got cameras, we've got enough wires to make spaghetti. We've got a big type of board. We've got all these kind of stuff. It's, it's really a lot of things to carry around. Some of us have big backpacks and the tripod as well, all this. But today, uh, I've been teaching mobile journalism for over three years, and it's this year, these couple of years, that it's actually changed so much. Our phones have gotten so much more powerful in the last few years that you can have almost everything in the left picture now inside your smartphone. And this is a basic look of what it can, what the difference really is. Traditional broadcasting, which is what I was doing, involves you going there, setting up a camera. There are a lot of reasons for why you want to have a big uh, setup for this, why you want to have a big camera, why you want to have a elaborate audio and all these kinds of things. But today you can do about, I would say 80 to 90% of that with 20% of the amount of equipment. So there are some pros and cons in what you can do with uh, mobile journalism. So the first thing is, well, everyone can broadcast news now. Anyone can put news on their Instagram, on their Twitter, on their Facebook. And it's, become a point where it's also the problem. When was the last time you saw maybe an accident? Let's just talk about this evening. KL is flooded, Kajang is flooded. How many photos and videos have you seen on social media before you even heard the report on your radio, on official news, on websites, or even uh, through an SMS or WhatsApp message from your friend? You already knew that KL was flooded before the news even knew it. Everyone can make news now. And it sometimes helps us as journalists. We can do a lot more because now we have equipment that is connected to the internet. Before this, our cameras are not on the internet. Now we can just take video and send it to our YouTube channel or to our editor in the newsroom very, very quickly. And the cons of this is for those of us in journalism, now our boss says, hey, now you, now you can do a lot more with so much less, you know, we give you less budget, but you, we want you to do twice the work. <laughs> so that's a problem that happens to us. And uh, the, the next one is the turnaround time. And this, again, in the last five to six years has, has gotten so short because maybe about 10 years ago, we would, we would record something, take it home, edit, put it on YouTube. That would take maybe a few hours. Then YouTube be became an app on our phone that we can do it in a few minutes. But today we have Facebook Live, we have Instagram TV. We have it in a few seconds, not even after the thing is happening, but when it's actually happening through live content. The, 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 the problem with this is that you don't have time to edit. So if you shake your phone, you drop your phone while you're going live, the quality of the content is not going to be so good. And just like that also, while this is a very innovative way of doing news, credibility is difficult. So we have a lot of problems with credibility in the news when we have, especially right now, we are all aware of the war in Ukraine. There's a lot of visuals being shared around, a lot of photographs of uh, military vehicles, of soldiers. And some people who have been doing research on this found out that some of these pictures are from five, six years ago, and people are pretending to post them as if they happened just yesterday. So in, we've reached a point in social media where we don't even have time to check what we're looking at. And some people have taken advantage of this. But the point of this course is, right, you, you know, when people say that we can 
already use our phone to go online. People ask, so why why do you need to teach mobile journalism? Shouldn't I lose my job? Because it's it's not it's not relevant anymore. What I'm here to help you all do and help you all understand is first of all, if you can and you have the time, how to plan for it. And number two is if there's something happening and there's 10 people with their phones trying to record it, what makes you different? What makes your recording, well, better or more appealing than someone who is just recording for fun? So let's go into it. Um, basic equipment, when we, do when we do video, even with a basic camera, we have the camera itself, in this case, the phone. Um, a grip would be something like a tripod or something to hold the phone with. Some of us have external microphone and some of us have a light. But again, in the last five, six years, phones have gotten so advanced that phones are now even able to stabilize the footage on their own. So you don't need a grip. The microphone has gotten better. You don't need an external mic. And our phones already have lights on them, which we, which we use more often to see in the dark rather than to record video. We use it like a torchlight. There are some apps in the bottom right, and this is, these are slides from my previous sessions. They've been around for a long time. Uh, again, another thing that's developed a lot in the last few years is the number of apps that are in the market. This has created a problem for me when I was teaching this because everyone has different phones. I can't expect everybody to, I can't say to, you know, my whoever's having me teach as I say, I, I can only teach this to iPhone owners. That's not fair. I can only teach this to Samsung holders. That's not fair. So, it took a long time to find an app that works for everybody. And I'll be showing you all that app later in this session. Because right now you can do it too. And we will show you how to produce a video with just your smartphone. And of course, an internet connection. If you're watching this, you have internet. So I'm not worried about that. <laughs> now, here's the step-by-step -step guide on how to create a video on your phone. And this step-by-step -step guide is something that you will learn, but you realize not all the time you have time for this. Many times we can plan. We can plan when we want to do a story. So let's just say you want to participate in the storytelling competition. You want to talk about perhaps an invasive species in a forest or a nature reserve near you. You have time to do research. You have time to plan. But let's change the subject. What if there's a forest fire? You don't have time to plan. The fire is not going to wait for you. You have to go there and get the footage you know, without time to plan. So how are we going to go about this? There's always... Uh, a certain amount of planning you can do and a certain amount of knowledge you can have that will come in handy if you have to just go out there and wing it, if we say, you know, just go and be dynamic as things develop. The first stage in everything is pre-production. Of course, research, pre-interviews, if you have time to go and talk to people, it's like same, same as research, just go and talk to people, get to know what you're doing, talk to some experts, and of course, a script. So um, in, in terms of, uh, you see, when I was brought on to, to talk here in this workshop is that we were, talk, we were talking about International Day of Forests. And International Day of Forests is something that needs highlighting because we, you know, we only have one planet and we have to take care of our forests because we're losing so much of it day after day after day. The problem with it is it actually conflicts with the news values I'm about to talk to you about. One, timeliness. Timeliness is when we talk about news, is it old news or is it news that is relevant to now? One example I can give is the Delta variant of COVID. Yeah, COVID is relevant, but Delta, is, Delta was mostly destroyed by our vaccines. Right now we have Omicron. So if you do a news piece on Delta, it's late. It doesn't really have much timeliness right now, unless it has to impact. That means maybe is there, is there a Delta resurgence due to something? Then yes, there's impact. You, can, you have to talk about it. Now, the third is proximity, and this is where it gets very difficult for topics like nature and con you know, conserving our forests. Because so many of us live in concrete jungles. I live in Petaling Jaya, and a lot of us live in like KL, in cities that are well-connected in Malaysia. We don't see our jungles except when we go to Taman, Taman Negara for a holiday or something. We don't see enough of this. But proximity means it's close to you and you can be affected. Like right now, what's in the news? Banje. Because why? It's in KL. It's blocking the road. We care about it. So if you have two pieces of news in front of you, like um, there is, uh, we, we, we obviously know that there is a forest issue logging in the northern states. I won't say which one, lah, because I don't want to get in trouble. So, you know, we have a forest logging issue in the north. And also we have Banje in KL. Which one is more relevant? 
to someone living in KL, like me, living in PJ, lah, close enough to KL, like me, proximity to KL means I care more about the banjir. It affects me more. The challenge in this program is how can you make people care about something that is so far away from so many urban people living in the concrete jungle, like me and some of you who are watching today. That's where number four comes in, the prominence. It is very easy to see a banjir. You know there's water there, you know the car to glam already, you know there's, it's, it's done for. You see the impact straight away. But whenever we see poko falling, we see forest fire, we don't see the prominence because we don't see the impact fast enough. And usually that's what makes a lot of these stories about nature get pushed back into you know, news that is not important because it doesn't feel prominent. You know, when we see people go out for, you know, demonstrations to raise awareness about forests, it's often not seen as important as, say, Kerajaan Buat Pengumuman, something like that. You know, we had MCO, we had press releases every day, you know, for a long time last year, two years ago. It, it, it's difficult to have prominence. So in this case, when we talk about news values, this is where, as a journalist, we will select what's important for us. But in the context of this seminar, this is where you would have to select something that has, you, know, you believe needs to be highlighted, that you think people need to see, okay? The next one is conflict. That one needs no introduction. We already know what's happening in Ukraine. There's, a, there's an obvious conflict there and people, people like to watch violence. Lah. So that's an issue. And people will want to keep up to date with it because it can affect their lives. It can affect the economy. It can affect, like we see now, banking system, internet, uh, human rights and stuff like that. Uh, number six is novelty. Novelty is when you see these goofy news stories uh, about, you know, things that look nice but aren't really that important. So some of them make news because like, you, you've seen any news that usually concerns Gu Guinness Book of Records or Malaysian Book of Records. Those are novelty. And the last is human interest, which is where most of the stories regarding nature fall into. It's human interest, which is something that we should be interested in. It is a topic that is not necessarily as relevant to us, but something that you know, we all can partake in in terms of our interest. Now, let's talk about a script. Usually, like again, when I said earlier, if there's a forest fire, you don't have time to plan. You run out there and you shoot it. But when you're doing any other form of video recording, some people say no plan is the best plan. That is not particularly true. Some people say no plan is the best plan. Why? Because when they plan, they spend so much time planning, they go out there and shoot and they don't follow their plan. The point of a shooting script is to have a plan that you can think about and that you can change as you go along. That's the way I go about it. There are people who have different philosophies on this, but the way I approach this is that you have a script, you know what you want, and it might change. It's better than not knowing what you want at all. Now, don't be intimidated. This is how most videos have their scripts. It's called an AV script, audio-visual script. On the left side, you see people, you see uh, what is going to be seen, what is on the screen, and on the right audio, what is heard, what is being played uh, as the audio. And uh, this looks intimidating because it looks very technical. And you're not expected to put together something this professional. This is something we do when we have a lot of time to plan. Sometimes we just write very scribbly uh, notes in the form of an AV script just to think about what we want. And this is another example of a more detailed AV script. Again, a lot of technical terms here, you won't have to know all of these technical terms, but some of them will be useful and I'll be going into them. So these technical terms. For visuals, we talk about a shot. What kind of shot do we have? How close is the camera to the subject? Now, there, there are some examples down the line, but a medium shot is usually if you take a picture of someone from the waist up. An establishing shot is when you try and take a picture of everything that's going on. So what you do is if you're talking about, again, like a forest or a nature reserve or something, Go as far as you can from it and take a video of the whole place as much as you can cover in your, in your lens. The reason why establishing shots are important, usually they only appear once or twice, but establishing shots are so powerful that if you mess up or you accidentally delete something, you can put an establishing shot there and it'll still make sense. This is a big kept secret in the journalism industry. Whenever we mess up and screw up or delete something, we just use an establishing shot to cover the mistake. Uh, for the close-up, medium close-up and extreme close-up, we'll show you some examples after this, but the way I go about it is how close is the camera to the eyes of the person? How, how 
big are the person's eyes. In a close in a close up, you have you can still see the shoulders. In a medium, you can still see the face, but in an extreme, you're almost only looking at the eyes. This is when you're shooting people, but there are close-ups that don't involve people. They can involve body parts like hands or feet. It can involve animals, and they have different ways of approaching this. Next one is a cutaway. A cutaway is when you are putting, when you, let's just say you're playing a video of someone talking, and they say something like, oh, and I noticed that um, in... text on the screen. So the supers, uh, a super is basically putting words on the screen. It can be anything from talking about the location of where screen and it Mr. Daniel, yes. uh, we quite lost you just now. Oh sorry, uh where where was I? Uh, the supers. Okay, sure. Yeah, sorry, I think I got an internet warning. Give me a second. Okay. okay. So a super is on a screen. It's a piece of uh, text that appears that can provide some information. Maybe where is this being shot? Or what's going on? Some extra information to explain. A lower third is text that usually shows the name and the uh, job description or the designation of a certain person. So if I'm talking right now, it will be Daniel Anthony, um, mobile journalism instructor. So that's what a lower third would be. You see this in the news all the time. Um, subtitles, no need to explain. We all watch Netflix. And a piece to camera is not, a actually this is a bit misplaced, a piece to camera is basically a shot where you are talking to the camera. Usually it's you, and it's usually done in a medium shot. Um, over to audio, a voiceover is when you narrate over the video. That means you are speaking, you recorded yourself speaking, or someone else speaking, and you put it over a shot to describe what's going on or something like that. When we say sound on tape, it means that you are using the sound that you recorded on the visual. So it's usually used for interviews or when someone is speaking. And an up sound is the same as an, a sound on tape, but it's when it's not someone speaking, when it's like a sound of a river, when it's the sound of an animal or something like that. And the last one is music, which is used universally in video all over. So here are some examples. This is a shot, a simple shot. Uh, this is a piece to camera, as you can see, PTC is on the screen that they're just describing there's a piece to camera. So it says the making of United, it is describing what's going on. The bottom is a subtitle. This whole shot is a medium shot because it's taken from above the waist. You can see, you can see the arms quite clearly, you can see his full face and all his shoulders as well. Um, when you're indoors, an establishing shot is taken from a distance. See, there's very little context as to what's going on. We don't know what he's doing, but it's just relevant to our story. That is why this is the shot that you usually start with, just to show that, oh, it's happening in a bedroom. If you're outdoors, again, as far as you can, especially if you can climb up a building, not, not climb the panjat, the, the outside of the building, like go upstairs through the lift or something and take a video from the top floor. And it shows people, oh, this is where it's happening. This is where it's taking place. Uh, this is a medium shot, another form of medium shot. It's a little wide, wider than the one I showed you earlier. Again, waist up, that means it's medium. And we have a lower third showing who is speaking. Now, close-ups, again, earlier I mentioned close-ups usually have to do with the face. But in this case, it can be close-ups of hands, it can be close-ups of animals, it can be close-ups of even if you see, see someone cooking the pot or what it is. And... You can even show details on a screen, like someone is typing, if they're using Microsoft Word, you can zoom into the screen to show what they're typing, or if they're searching something on Google, search, show what they are searching. Uh, these are different types of close-ups. This is medium, and a medium close-up is where you can still see the shoulders usually. Now, when we come to piece to camera, when it comes to anything you have to do with uh, doing stuff and talking to the camera, you have to use all the space that you have. Your camera is so small. If you look at your phone, your camera is less than the size of a 10 cent point. It's very small. You can do so much with everything that's around that camera. So what I do is if I want to do a piece to camera, something that a lot of people don't know is that they think we journalists and newscasters, when we do piece to camera, we memorize the whole script, 10, 20 pages long, we read the news every day. No, we don't do that. 
what we actually do is we use a teleprompter. We use a prompter that is able to feed us information in front of the camera so that it looks like we are memorized it and talking straight to the screen. A teleprompter is quite expensive. So because of that, I have to talk about uh, use. Mr. Daniel, we lost you again and the teleprompter is quite expensive. Oh gosh, so sorry about that. So I was saying the teleprompter is quite expensive because it's professional equipment. But if you, again, there's so much space around the camera. Your camera is still about just as big as, smaller than a five cent coin. What you do is you can stick post-it notes to your phone to remind you of your script. You can stick stickers on the wall behind your phone to show you, to, to remind you what you have to say. A lot of people think we memorize everything we say on camera. We don't. Nobody, can, nobody really does that. We can, and by doing this, we take advantage of the space around our phone to help us memorize our scripts, to help us uh, recite, remind us what we have to talk about. Uh, the next thing I'm going to talk about is a little technique that one of my instructors taught me, and it's called the BBC Five Shot Pattern. This is an excellent way to tell a story with a very quick approach. If you heard of 5W1H, who, what, where, when, why, how, this is how to, how to do something really quick and explain, especially when it's surrounding a person. And you can think of anything. If this person is replanting a seedling, this person is cooking a traditional food dish, this person is uh, trying to you know, clear some rubbish out of uh, a, a, a drain or something. So first shot, do a close-up of the hands. Answer the question, what is he doing? What is this person doing? Are they cleaning something? Are they removing something? And then two, answer the who. Who is this person? Put the, put the you know, show their face, the whole face, not the not not not, not a super close up. Just show the whole face. The third, go a bit wider. Where is it? Have them in the have them inside the frame and just show what's going on. And the fourth one is an over the shoulder, which is basically you put your camera behind their shoulder so you can see the back of their head and also what they are doing. And the last one is choose a way of holding your camera to show maybe what's the effect of what they're doing. This is where you get to have a unique take on it. If let's just say they're cleaning a drain, hold your phone low in the drain to see, okay, that, that this is actually blocking the water flow and that this This is the last shot where you get to be creative. If you do all these five shots, you basically have already told a very simple story. It's not supposed to appear, I think, but yeah. Well, um, usually at this point will be, I would tell you know, my class to do a shooting script, but um, because we are, bit, we are kind of like rushing on time, so what we're going to do is we're going to explain how to do it quickly. So again, like I showed you earlier, usually AV script is like this. You can take a screen cap of this particular screen if you want to try something like that out. It's basically, you can do it in Microsoft Excel or Microsoft Word, just four columns. Number is just showing the sequence, uh, visual, audio, and the last column, DUR, stands for duration, how long it should be. This is very good when you're planning how long your video should be, and I'll explain that later in the session about why that is also very important. Now, this is how I also do my exercise if you want to try this out. So, we didn't have time to prepare for this session in terms of sometimes we might, when I do these previous sessions, we have time to go out and shoot. So what I tell my class is, if you want to practice this, one great way to practice is pretend that your eyes were your camera and everything that you saw for the last two, three weeks is downloaded into your phone or your computer. That way you can think about, oh, I saw this and maybe I can use this shot in a video. This is something that you can do uh, to practice preparing to shoot a video. And it, as you do this, you will start to build this habit of how to hold your camera when you go out. And that is basically almost the starting point of how you start to make your footage more appealing than everyone else. You are not just hantam whole camera and you hold wrong. Or, you know, some people make the big mistake of holding their phone vertically when they, when they shoot video, it's not a wrong, it's not completely wrong. Some people who are streaming on Instagram TV, for instance, they hold their phone vertically. But how many people have watched videos on Facebook where people are holding it vertically? And 
it's awkward because you're watching it on your desktop and it's straight and it's not using your whole screen. These are the things that most people wouldn't think about, but you now, as you build a habit, you also have a chance to think about before you shoot. myself. Uh, this concerns what you are going to say to the camera. A lot of people think it's easy to read, but once you turn on a camera and try and read, you realize you're not very good at reading. It's kind of like, I, I don't know why it's like that. Like, a lot of people like this, once the camera in front of them, the red light is on, they don't know how to read already. And it's not something that you can say, oh, I don't face this. A lot of people face this. Uh, so what you can do is you can improve your script to make it easier to read. Here's an example, okay? This was on a teleprompter one day, and it's actually looks, it looks innocent. It looks completely fine. But if you try and read it, it will go like Tajuddin Abdul Rahman has been sacked as Prasarana chairperson following the catastrophic press conference concerning the carnage caused with the train cars collided on the Glanajai LRT system earlier this week. It took me years of practice to be able to read it like that. The problem is when you have words like this, what do they have all in common? They all start with C. And you will trip when you read this. And this is something that will frustrate you as when you're trying to do a piece to camera. You will find that, hey, how come I cannot read this? I wrote this. So what you can do is you can look for problems like this. This is called alliteration. It's actually part of uh, English literature and poetry. And you might have come across this in uh, Sastra in high school as well. What you can do is these are things that you can look out for in your script if you're having trouble rewrite it into something easier to read and you'll be you'll find out that okay now i have a much better control over my script so the next part i'm going to talk about is the storyboard this is something that is a big turn off to a lot of journalists a lot of video makers and uh, you may have seen this if you especially if you've seen any making of or any movies about how disney makes cartoons and stuff like that you're essentially making a comic of your video so you know what you want to shoot. You are preparing your idea of what's going to happen in your video. So um, this one is all you know is from a country called Lilo Stitch. And it can be any level of complex. Like you can make you stick figures instead. You're just trying to prepare yourself for what you're going to shoot. So when you go and actually do the shoot, you realize, okay, next shot, I need to take video of, in this case, this girl named Sarah. I need a, a close up of Sarah holding the photograph. So you don't waste time thinking, oh, uh, what should I shoot next? And it can be as rough or as elaborate as you want it to be, as long as you remember what you were thinking about. But here's the thing. Not all of us can draw. I can't draw. A lot of people can't even draw a stick figure. And I feel you. I empathize with you. This is difficult. So how I approach this as a journalist is what I did was called a short list. So you'll need to list down. This is something that can be done both before and after recording. Uh, am I still there? I think my connection is a bit unstable. Yeah, you're still there. Okay, great. Yeah, my, my screen just lagged for a moment. All right. Now, when you list down all the shots you have, this is after you've done a recording. You can, you can choose what you want or you can do this. It's a bit like chicken and egg. Either you list down what you want or list down what you have. For journalists, we go somewhere. It's difficult to plan. We also don't know what's going to happen. So we... We do this in post, but you can do this before shooting as well. And you can use note-taking apps. I use Google Keep. You can use Evernote, Google Docs, or Apple Notes if you have an iPhone. And so you show, by making this table, this is if you really have the time for it. You have a description. Okay, then this is like, how video editing used to be back in the day of film where people used to cut the film into, into pieces and then describe, okay, this is number one A, this one contains a visual of Paul, this one is number one B, it's very, very troublesome, it's very long. I don't expect this to be you know, what you need to plan. This is how I do it instead. What I do is I copy all the footage from my camera and I sort them into folders. So I have, I know exactly what's happening in each folder. 
if I want to say, okay, um, my first scene will be me going to the airport. I go scene 1.1, I take out the footage from there. I would like to have a picture of the aeroplane taking off. There, see, I have a scene 2.1 takeoff. I can immediately go, in, go into this folder and grab the vi visual I want from it. So while I'm saying this, I did this in reverse. I shot the footage first and then only I started to process it. But you can do this the other way. You can create these folders before you shoot. So I you say, okay, I know I want to take footage of going to the airport. I know I want to take footage of um, a being in, in the plane. I want to take footage of the JFK airport, for instance. After you finish, then you know exactly where to start sorting everything. This is from a forum in 2015. And this is something this is the time code thing I mentioned earlier. This is when you are recording somebody speaking or an event happening. So what I'm doing is, if you see on the left here, I am taking down time. Most of our phones will show you in the top of the screen how long the video has been recording for. So I have a, I have a notepad with me and I'll write down, okay, at 4 minutes 15 seconds, he said, you don't need any qualifications to be a politician. Then later at 6.20, uh, nobody said this, 8.30. So you see, I recorded a long video. This video is going past 22 minutes. If I go back home and I want to think about what he said, I have to watch the 22 minutes again just to find one idea. That's a waste of time. By doing this, I can go straight to the part of the video where I can find the points I want. In fact, what I even do is I put a star on the ones that I think are important so I can make sure that I go and emphasize on this when I do my editing later. This is a very handy thing to do because especially when you are doing events, when you're covering speeches or debates, this is very, very handy to have. And now that you are ready and finished with your planning, the next step is the actual going out, shooting, doing the thing. This is where, again, as I said, you may lose, you may not follow 60, 70, 80, maybe 90% of your plan. But the concept of having the plan is still important because it at least when you don't have, when you when you ask yourself the question, what do I do next? You have the idea already. When you're on the ground and you ask yourself what to do next and you don't know what to do, then you're in trouble. Because then you know a lot of things happen only once. You can't go back and you can't rewind time. So because of that, if you have a plan, you know what to get at what time and how to make the best of one shot. So there are things to remember, of course, when going out. All it takes is one forgotten item when you go out. You forgot to charge your phone, power bank, something like that. It's one problem and it'll mess your whole day up. I'm sure everyone has had those, has had those days. You know, you drive all the way to office, forgot to bring your ID card, that kind of stuff but it can happen to anyone. So there are some logistical issues that you can do, that, that you can think about. So first of all, location scouting is if you have time, you can go to where you're shooting beforehand, learn about the place. And I'm not just talking about the, you know, go and study the area, even the simple things, where to park your car, how to go in, do you have to pay to go in? And even some of the most basic questions should also be asked like, can you record video here? You don't want to prepare, bring all your equipment and suddenly kena kejar. Sorry, you cannot record video here. Then you've got a problem. Uh, that's it, under permissions as well. And the second one is scheduling and call times. Think about the time when you're going to go. You know, if you're going to go and record, maybe you should go early in the morning so it's not hot. So it's not, you know, you don't sweat so much. You can check your weather report to see the, the, the weather for the day. Unfortunately, now is not a good time. Like you should kind of if you go. And the call time is also if you're bringing a crew along, what time you agree to be there. So um, while we're doing this on the idea of everyone being able to do this on their own, if you have a team, make sure that when you reach there, they don't say they're on their way. And of course, the last one is equipment check, not just before, but after as well. Did you drop something? Did you leave something behind? There are three things to think about when you shoot video. One is focus, two is lighting, three is composition. These are easy things to memorize. Once you learn these three, you start thinking more actively about how your video is going to look after it's recorded. Not, you know, while there are a lot of softwares today that are very powerful, they can fix video after you record. If you get these three right, 
you have basically shot a very, you know, a, quite a usable video that will be easier to edit later. First one is focus. iPhones implemented what's called touch focus all the way back in the first iPhone, where if you want to focus on something, you make sure that part is sharp. You, you tap it on the screen. Um, most phones have it now especially since 2017, 18, around there, most phones and Samsung's and Xiaomi's have started implementing it as well. Older phones might not have this. The second is lighting. Now, lighting is something that can be difficult to achieve because you don't get to choose where the sun is in the sky when something happens. The only thing you can do is try to be there at the right time. But if you have somebody who's talking to you, you can bear in mind certain things. Try and make sure their face is well lit like the guy on the left. There are things you should always avoid. You should never take a video of somebody when the sun or anything bright is behind them. Then they'll turn out completely dark. So these are things to think about. And, you know, it's not rude to ask somebody to move a bit. You know, just say, can you move a bit to this side so that the sun is not shining? There's no shadow on this part of your face. It's okay to ask these kind of questions. The last one is called composition. This is something that can actually give your video a bit of an edge. You notice when you start your phone, some phones will have like these nine boxes on the screen. We don't, some people don't really bother to ask what it is. This is to help you with composing your shot. See, see the guy on the left, what you have, what you want to try to do is put the most important part of your video where the lines cross in one of those crosses. In this case, he's on the top right. How do we choose the top right? Look at where his eyes are pointing. His eyes are pointing a bit to the left. How do you know this? You see his left ear, but not his right. So his face is tilted towards the left. That means if he's looking left, give him space to look left. That's how you choose which point on the screen to do it. I hope, I, I hope this is coming through clearly. Because when you do that, it gives a very comfortable way to watch it. Similar to the one on the right. You see, you, see, you only see his right ear. Because you see only see his right ear, it means he's looking to the right. Position him in the left so he can look to the right. Here are some more examples. This is uh, one on the left, which is actually a good shot. And the one on the right, which is not very good. Why is it not very good? It's because why do I need to see the emergency above her head? Her head it's not important. Anything above someone's head, unless it's really important, shouldn't be there. There should be very little room above the head because then... I don't know where to look. Now, some people prefer centering. When you do a piece to camera, if you're looking directly into the camera, centering is usually better. If, you are doing, if you're doing a piece to camera, you can also try do, doing the rule of thirds. But in the space that you are leaving behind, like let's just say you stand on the right, think about what should be on your left. If you are doing it from where you are, try and show the activity you're talking about. Like maybe there's deforestation, maybe there is a, an incident going on. Try and put something to look at in that space. And the one on the, the shot on the right in this case has a problem with a human body part known as the knee. The knee is something to be careful about when doing a shot. If you show the knee, you should show the feet. If you don't show the knee, if you don't show the feet, don't show the knee. Just go straight from the waist up. Do a medium close up. Because when you show the knee, now, you have to ask this question, how tall is the guy? You don't know. He could be 10 feet tall. You'd have no idea because of the way this shot is. And therefore, it throws people off. You don't know how tall they are. You don't know where the ground is. And last but not least, the space above their head doesn't make sense. Now, the next part is audio. A lot of people don't think much about audio because video is like, you know, they say video killed the radio star. Like, but then people will listen to radio because... You can look away from the screen, but the audio still tells a story. Now, people always focus on visuals, getting this, you oh, shot gonna chante, you have to make it look great, make it look good, all this kind of stuff. But audio can be more important. Why? One, remember, if you screwed up your shot on the camera, go back to your establishing shot. It's the way we patch over every mistake we make. But if you screw up the audio, you cannot get it back. You almost can never get the audio back if you mess it up. So it's, it's, it's um, you know, talking among friends, people can tolerate seeing the video that is low quality. You know, remember once upon a time we used to have this, why should we buy the gold disc original, not the purple disc DVD-R? People can tolerate watching that. But if the audio is bad, 10 seconds or so, they'll just leave. They cannot tahan, okay? 
you realize during that video, the audio was very clean, but the video looked like rubbish. <laughs> people can tahan bad visuals. People cannot tahan bad audio. So here's how we can help. Here's how audio can be fixed. One, actually zero. There's something that I want to talk about here that has changed also in the last few years, but it's one of the things that has changed for the worst in the smartphone industry. Your hands free. Once upon a time, when you buy a phone, you get headphones. You get free headphones in the box. Now, that headphone, the mic on that headphone is a very good mic, especially on the older iPhones. If you plug the headset in and you hold the mic out, just the wire, you can pick up very good speech sound. But in the last few years, first of all, they stopped giving us headphones. Now, phones don't even have the headphone jack. That is a problem. So this is not this used to be a big technique in the journalism industry where we use the head, headset mic to record audio but now it's becoming more and more difficult so the first one is if you have the chance to interview somebody and they are willing to go find a spot that's quiet if you're doing it in the middle of the forest it's a bit difficult because you have a lot of the animal sounds and if a wind blows you can hear it very strongly try to find a place that's quiet not just quiet in terms of sound but quiet in terms of wind if you've blown into a microphone, you realize it, you can hear that, that <laughs> sound. You don't want that. So of course, if you find a quiet spot, that's the best. The second is if you can use a second phone or second device to record audio. This is uh, something that can help because you can later try and synchronize the two, but it's a lot of work. So the quiet spot is of course the better place. Third is to test before you actually do a, do a record. Like what you do is, you say, okay, let's try and record here. You record 10 seconds of audio. You, 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 you say something. Maybe you have a conversation, short conversation with the person you're interviewing. And then you listen back to it and see, okay, hmm, this is not clear. Let's try somewhere else. Before you actually go and record. Because the, worst, the last thing you want to do is go straight in, record. After that, you listen like, I cannot use this. Remember, it's almost impossible to turn back time. You can maybe ask the person for a second interview. A very slim chance you're going to get that. You can't turn back time when you're recording. For voiceovers, this one, there's a lot of silly ways you can do this at home. You can go under a blanket, it's very panas, but you can go under a blanket to get a quiet space to record, especially if you live near a road. And the number five, clap. What does clap mean? The clap is if you're using a second device, you should always clap after you press record on both your camera and the device so that when you later do the synchronization and make sure that the, the audio and the camera is the same time, you look for when your hands clap on the screen and you find the sound of the clap on the recording and you make sure that they're together. Okay, now um, I think we can take a short break right now because I'll have, I have another set of slides after this to go through. Uh, Fajabat, do you wanna take some questions in the break or how do we wanna do this? Uh, thank you, um, so uh, again for the participants, so if, if you have any questions, so yeah. okay, uh, we have one question from Jen, mm -hmm. all right, for taking a mixture of a medium or close-up footage, do you usually use a multiple camera or multiple footage with one camera? or one same footage by using different zoom level in post-production. Any tips on getting varied focus levels or distance of one footage with just one camera? Uh, okay. The uh, question, is it? Uh, where do I see the questions? Huh? Is it, oh, QA, I see. Down, okay, yeah. okay, I see. It makes sure it's a medium. Usually one. Um, okay, you are basically asking how hard I cheat in... Uh, doing my news it's <laughs> true yes for taking mixtures i usually do zoom levels in post-production because i you know we only have two hands so what we do is especially for you know in my experience at kini tv we used to be known as the one-man show because we all we send one journalist out where sometimes other news outlets can send two or three we send one journalist out and they do all the work it made us very independent and it also helped us to achieve, you know, with a small team, we still managed to cover a lot of news. But the difference is that what, what I used to do is I used to shoot, uh, if my camera had the feature, I shoot 4K, 
the highest resolution I can. And then I go back to the studio and I change the different zoom levels in post-production. From 4K, you can crop out a smaller video that is still sharp. So I, 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 I would do that, yes. Um, on varied focus levels, there is there are ways to do this with photos, but with video, not yet. So varied focus levels or distance from footage with just one camera, I would say that you have, you basically said it, like, same footage using different zoom levels in post-production. That is what many of us do, not just me. And the good thing about this, if you have more advanced software, especially on a computer like Final Cut Pro or DaVinci Resolve Studio, you can use the stability, stabilization features and get a very steady shot as if it was taken with a professional steady cam or something. Because not all of us have steady hands when we record. Nowadays, phones have stabilizers. Not, not talking about the gimbal stabilizer, you know, built into the phone, they have stabilizers that help us cancel out our hand movements. So we have a lot of uh, features in our phones that we even don't know about that help to compensate for this. Uh, so yeah, multiple footages with just one camera. Occasionally, again, this is something to do with uh, what I said about turning back time. We may not be able to turn back time, but if you have somebody who's willing to cooperate, ask them, Let's, can I take this shot from a different angle once again and repeat it? But you have to be very careful with this. You can do this for an interview. You can do this for a demonstration of, a, of an action, but never do this in a, in a scenario like a protest. Now, this is something that's told to us, never reenact. Like one of the big examples given is if you go for a violent protest, okay? Somebody takes a brick throw at a building, break the window, and you didn't get that on camera. You don't go and take out your camera and ask, hey, paling satu lagi. You don't do that. <laughs> That's something you should never do as a journalist. <laughs> so, you know, if you're, in a if you're in a closed environment and you want to show for the sake of demonstration a, a different angle, you can politely ask the person, your, your talent or your subject to do it again, but not in a scenario where it's live, where, where you're asking them to reenact an actual action. Hope that answers your question. Okay, Thank you, Mr. Daniel. Hope that answer Jen and helping him in the uh, mobile journalism. So bear in mind again uh, to participant, if you have a question, uh, you can respond via voice or chat. However, please raise your hand before speaking and the host will allow you permission to speak and enter your question or upvote question that you also like to know. Okay, back to you, Mr. Daniel. All right. So now we're going to talk about after you've done your shooting. So I know we just talked about what to do when you go out and shoot, what, you've, what to do when you go out and uh, catch your footage already. You've recorded everything. Now you've come home. You want to start working on the video. And I'm going to keep this as limited to a phone as possible because uh, the question from Jen earlier was to do it post-production. While this is possible on some phones, you can add these kind of effects to do this kind of zoom. And I have done it before. Um, phones are still very limited. Phones are, you know, we, we use our phones for a lot of things. They do, the phones are good at doing a lot of things, but they're not good at doing one thing very well. And I say this seriously because now phones also cannot make phone call properly. So in terms of post-production, what we do is we do two steps, offline and online editing. So offline means we are going to put together the footage based on the script, the script that we use to plan the whole thing. So see, maybe your script didn't, wasn't useful in production, you bring it back during post production and you try to make you try to fit things into it after that online is when you start decorating it making it look nice uh, again there's a lot of limitations to online editing while you're on a phone now this is going to get a bit technical and i'm going to try to make this as uh, simple as possible i could have taught you one specific app. i could have today we're going to use imovie or today we're going to use final cut and i'm going to can teach you just that one app now I learned to not do this because if that app disappears from Google Play or the App Store tomorrow, what I taught you today will be useless. Because it's, it's you know, if I teach you just one app, then you're going to be reliant on that one app. And, uh, I, I don't, and I'm not saying that this is true, any fault of your own, but because that's just how uh, mobile apps have become. You know, you can have an app today, even if you paid a subscription for it tomorrow, it can disappear from the App Store. So I'm going to teach video editing in a simple way so that after this, 
hopefully you can open any video software and you can see the similar parts in it and it can help you understand how to use it. In order to do that, we need to go back to how video first started. This is the film role. A film role is how film, you know, first moving pictures were done. It's basically a projector that, that goes through frame by frame. That means every little step of the film is in one frame. Uh, you've seen flip book comics, how they draw one frame by one frame and then do a flip and then you see the cartoon moving. This is how it was for film back then. But what we want to focus on is the cassette. Cassettes are basically a form of a way of recording video to, it was semi-digital almost because it uses magnetic strips, it uses uh, electronic technology. It wasn't completely digital like uh, how we have DVD and uh, SD cards today. So when you open up the cassette player, you'll see this, okay? What we want to focus on is the rotating head drum and uh, this black line, it's called tape, okay? These are the main things you have to understand. How does it work? When you use the tape recorder, the drum will touch the tape and you pull the tape over the drum and it will read the tape. So when it reads the tape, you see the video on your TV. When we first started video editing long, long ago in the, in the 80s and 90s, maybe even the 70s, video editing was linear because the tape had to be, had to be run by a moto it was going in one direction. So Jalan Sahala, one way only. That means you had to edit by pressing buttons as in like, okay, now I want to show the footage from camera one. Now I want to show the footage from camera two. Da, 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 da. You make a mistake, you go back to the start. That was how it was back then. You, don't make, you, you almost had no room to make mistakes during the linear days. When we reached about the 2000s, we started to have non-linear editing. And this will look familiar to some as Adobe Premiere Pro, one of the most popular non-linear editing software in the world. But non-linear editing means now, if we make a mistake, we can correct just the mistake. Why? Because the tape is not being powered by a motor, we can choose where we want to go in time. Now, this may sound weird, but there are a few, I'll explain more in detail how that works. First of all, when it comes to editing on our phones, most apps do one of three different styles of editing. One that doesn't happen much now is the autopilot way. You go to your gallery, you select one, two, three, four, five videos, you press a button and the phone magically makes a video with some effects and titles. This was very popular during the early days of camera phones when cameras first started getting into mobile phones. All the videos that come out of it were very you know, simple, and second one is auto storyboard. That means now you have a bit more control. You choose which video you want first, which video you want second, which video you want third. And the final one is called timeline. Timeline is where you have full control over how long each video is, where you want it. An analogy for this is like a car. Okay, so you have a full auto a gearbox. It's autopilot. It does all the switching for you. You don't need to think about it. Uh, auto storyboard is like those cars that have a manual switch, but you don't have a clutch. You know, you can choose when to change gear, but the, eventually the, actually the car computer decides it for you. And the last one is timeline is just full manual. You are in complete control over what you see on the screen. We'll be focusing on the timeline. Now, to explain the timeline, I need to first explain how a timeline works. When we see a ruler, what do we think? We measure distance. We measure distance between two points. But when it comes to video editing, we also have a ruler, but that ruler measures time. So you see at the far left, it's zero. When you reach the right, we are approaching uh, 42 seconds. That means it's a bit hard to explain in simple terms, but you are actually looking at a ruler that measures time. How this works is we have to go back to looking at the cassette. Remember the, the black stuff there? It's the tape. And the tape is being moved by a motor. So let's just say you want to use some of this video on this tape. How it works is you go and find the part of the video you want. You take a scissors and you cut the tape out. And you put it onto the table under your ruler. So under your ruler, you measure, oh, okay, this amount of tape, because it's this long, it's about 24 seconds long. <laughs> That's why we have a time ruler in video editing. The second part is remember that we use a motor to pull the tape across the drum, the head drum. The head drum is what turns the tape 
into video that goes onto your TV screen. Am I still there, by the way? Yeah, 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 you're still there. Okay, good. I saw the something went <laughs> sorry, wrong with sorry. my screen. No, no, I saw something went wrong with my screen. Okay. So the, the, the head drum is what turns the tape into video for your screen. But in a, in a cassette player, the, tape, the, the drum is in one place and the tape is moving. On your computer or your phone, it's the other way around. This little red line here is the head. So instead of moving the tape across the head, you move the head across the tape. Where you put the head on the tape will show you on your screen what the video looks like at that time. Now, we can move the head. So how do we move the head? We use what's called transport. And this is where the car gear comes into play again. You can move the head in any direction because now you are non-linear. Non-linear means you're not going in only one direction. So you may recognize these symbols from your car and you may recognize these symbols from a cassette player or a, or a VCR recorder if you've seen one of these before. The play, fast forward, pause and reverse. And this controls how the head moves. You press forward, the, the head moves from left to right. You press backward, moves from right to left. So you're viewing the video in forward or backwards based on where the head is on the tape. The next bit is where the, the computer side of things comes into play. Layers. If you're familiar with Photoshop, you will know what I'm talking about. If not, think about the quay lapis, each layer. When you look at the top of a quay lapis, you only see one color. As you peel them away, you'll see what's below it. Now, some layers can be transparent, so you can see through them. Why this is important is let's come back to the timeline. Let's just say I take a piece of cello tape. Cello tape is transparent, right? So I put a cello tape on the table as well. On top of my videotape, and I write something on it. I say, check out my video. What I'm going to do here is, like I mentioned in the earlier set of slides, a super. That means I'm putting text on the screen. So when my head moves across here, it's reading the video, and it's also reading the layer on top of it. So what would be on the screen is the video and the text, check out my video. If I tabalik this and I put the video on top, then I can't see it because the video will block the layer at the bottom. This is a basic uh, gist of how nonlinear editing works. Now, the reason I'm going again into this is to make sure that if you, you can now probably start to see the similarities between the different softwares that you may have used before, that you may not have used before, and the software that I'm about to show you all later that um, some of you may have seen in the description of this uh, Zoom call as in uh, what software to download for this uh, little session. And that's the software, it's called Vlog Now. It's uh, V-L-O-G-N-O-W. You can check the Zoom call description, uh, no, sorry, the Zoom call chat. You'll see a link to download Vlog Now at www.vlognow.me, uh, V-L-O-G-N-O-W.me. That's where you can download this app. When you click into it, you'll find four functions. There you can download for Mac, Windows, Android, and uh, iPad and iPhone, if I'm not mistaken. Now. The Windows one is complicated because what it's actually trying to tell you is to download uh, BlueStacks, which you're trying to run an Android app on your Windows computer, which is a bit troublesome. So uh, for those of you on Windows computers, you should use your phone instead for this. Uh, if you're using a Mac, then it will need, uh, I think, Mac 10.15 or later because that is what is needed to run iPad-style apps on your Mac. Right, give me a moment, uh, let me switch. <laughs> okay, this is how Vlognow looks in, uh, in, the, in the context of the Mac I'm using. Hold on, I need to move something out of the way for this, yeah. And one of the difficult parts about this is that it looks different on everybody's phone because a lot of people have different versions of this app on their phone. I'll run through quickly what this uh, interface is like. And again, some of your phones may show this differently. You can import videos from your computer. What I mean by import video is that you are going to uh, add videos to your timeline. So I have some videos here that I'm going to import that I have... Uh, Second. Okay. 
Okay, let's use this. Again, it's, I, I understand it's a bit difficult because not all of you have uh, recorded videos prior to this session. Okay, let's use these couple of videos here right now that I have. Okay, you might get uh, already something put in your timeline down here from the app by default. You can delete that. So while I add a video, let's take this video. This is a video I took outside of the Indonesian embassy when I was there for a news assignment. Now, see the similarities here. We've got this down here, this yellow part where my mouse is. I hope you can see my mouse. Is a piece of tape. And this white line is your video head. So as I move the scroll, you can see on top the video is moving because it's showing me what is exactly at that point in the tape. I can add a title using, uh, and I also need to figure out this one because I used this on my phone last time. You can add a title. That's not how it looks. I have to add titles here. When I click on title inside the add function, again, most uh, you might have to play around with this on your individual phones. The interface is slightly different on different phones. I'm going to add a standard title, pull it in here. And now it's going to ask me what I want to add. So I'm going to just put example video. You can do some minor editing, make it bigger or smaller, move it around your screen to different places. I'll put it up here and I'll press the tick to confirm it. So now what we see on the timeline is you have this example video bit of tape on top of my video tape down here. So I'm going to scroll and after I pass it, example video disappears because it's past that point. It's past that piece of tape. Now there are a lot of uh, effects and crazy things you can do with this app. If I'm not mistaken, this is there is a similar app that's developed by the creators of TikTok, which is ByteDance, but this is developed by someone else. Um, you can uh, do things with your video. There are a lot of effects you can find down here. Yeah, there's a lot of crazy things you can do to make it look interesting, but you can also add a lot of, uh, yeah, you can keyframe. Keyframing is by doing basic animation. Uh, yeah, you have these features like when you tap on this video, this is specific to vlog now, by the way where you can do what, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Jen was asking just now, you can change the size of the video by tapping on it and using this control in this corner to change the size of the video. And one of the great features that Block now has is you can even correct the rotation. If you hold your camera wrongly, you can tilt your video to make it straight. Like, let's just say, let's get the text straight on this one. I don't know how exactly to do it with this, but yeah. There's a lot of features in Vlog now that you can use to enhance the video in order to make it look better, especially in low light. This is another course on its own because it's also touching on how to edit video. But basically the crash course here is what you want to do is you want to be able to choose the section of video. See very finely at the bottom here, it's a bit difficult to see, but that's your time ruler. It says four, five, six, seven seconds, eight seconds, nine seconds, 10 seconds. By pinching in and out, you know how to pinch zoom and zoom in your phone with two fingers. You can change how big this is. In this case it's here, yeah. So now you can see more of your timeline or you can get more precise by zooming in. You notice the time ruler also changes as you change the zoom level. The basic edit that I wanna show you all is the split. What you wanna do is you wanna cut the tape only to how much you want. Like, let's just say, I only want to show the, this front of the embassy for seven seconds, okay? I go and select until about seven seconds on the timeline, or in this case, the time code here shows 7.02S. I press the scissors and now I have two videos here. I have two pieces of tape. I press the one on the right and I press delete. 
or I think on the phone, if you click on it, there's a trash can. So I've done a simple edit here already. The next thing I can show you is let's just take this other video. I'm going to drag and drop it down here. And I am going to cut the video before the, as the bird disappears. All right, just here. Okay, I don't want to see it anymore. Split, click, delete. And now I have a very basic edit going on two videos that I've already selected how long they are. You can press the play button to see how it looks. So I think we have a bit more time left. I'm sorry, I can't go into very deep detail as to how to use a video editing software because it's something that, again, depends on your device, depends on the video you have and how it goes. Uh, but there are a lot of tutorials for Glock now available on YouTube that you can look up because this is a popular editing software and it is basically the holy grail. It is free. Very few video editing softwares that are this good are free. And the good thing about this, it comes with no ads. It's not like those that force you to watch an advertisement every 30 seconds. So it's one of the better video editing softwares that's available today. So um, before we wrap up, what happens is that I have to go through the last step. And the last step here is, let me just check my slides. Mm. moment. How do I move the zoom thing? Oh, there we go. Okay, let me uh, quickly share the screen. That's correct. <laughs> Okay, I hope you all can see my screen, right? Is my screen shared? I think it is, yes? Yes, yeah. Okay, great. So this is the last bit about what to do with your video after it's done. And this is something that, again, can also upset uh, what you learned just now. So quickly, I'm going to go through. You can share it on social sites, or you can also share it on your messaging platform like WhatsApp, Telegram, and some of us may use Discord. So size matters in terms of video, but there's a lot of talk about what does size mean in terms of video. There are many meanings to size. We have the resolution, which is how, how many pixels your video has, how sharp it is. The aspect ratio, meaning the shape of the video, the length of the video, how long it is, how big the file is. Sorry, yeah. So there are these main four uh, matters of size. When it comes to resolution, most of you would know the higher the number, the sharper it is because all videos are made out of dots. Some people think it's to do with absolute size. That is actually not the case because different screens have different resolution. And you'd be surprised to know like some phones like the Samsung Note 7 has more pixels than this OnePlus TV. So just because the screen is bigger doesn't mean it has more dots. Sometimes smaller screens have even more dots than a big screen. In terms of resolution, uh, this is something that I was mentioning earlier in passing when answering Jen's question. Yes, there are, I shoot in 4K, which is the highest resolution that most phones and cameras have today. And then I can crop it down. How it looks like when you crop is like this. You can shoot in 4K and have a wide shot and you can extract a HD, a high definition shot from the middle of it or from any part of it. And it will still look sharp and clear because there's still a lot of pixels in it. And just, to, just so that you can have a little bit of an understanding of how this works, the more dots you have, the sharper your picture will be. These are four different resolutions. And in the bottom right, you can see that the ones where you can clearly see the numbers are the ones with the most pixels. And uh, I will just breeze through these slides. What do the numbers mean? 1080p means that it's 10, 1080 pixels tall, not wide, tall. And this number, the higher it is, the sharper your video. In 4K, it's about 4,000 pixels tall. When you see two numbers, it's always the wider first. It's, it's, all, it's always the width first. So 1280 by 720 is 12, 1,280 pixels 
uh, across and 720 pixels vertical. The second one is aspect ratio. Now aspect ratio is something that we think that we all already know as nine by 16 or 16 by nine. We have many different shapes of screens in the world today. <laughs> what the numbers mean is the ratio of how many units on one side to the ratio of the units on the other. So just to see the math, if you wanna see how it works out, if you divide by 80, 1280 times 720 is 16 to nine, if this makes sense. It's kind of mathematical, but it explains what the ratio means. And if that in that same thing, if you tabalik the number to nine by 16, you get vertical video. You get a video like you're holding your phone vertically. So the essence of why I'm talking about this is today we have a lot of different types of screens. I have a, I wear a smartwatch. It has a circle screen. If you have a phone that is like, if you have one of those old Nokia phones, you have a square screen. How do we deal with this? There's so many screens. What you can do is make a video that is one by one, which means square. A square video looks great on almost all platforms. It doesn't look best on all platforms, but it looks great. What I mean by this is it looks good on Instagram. It looks good on Twitter. It looks good on Facebook. <clears throat> and it fills up a lot of the screen on a phone, not a full screen, but big enough. But things are different in a, in a, square, vid in a square video because you don't really have as much techniques like the rule of thirds. So what you should do is try to focus on putting the subject in the center of the video. That way you can focus on them. There's less things to distract your viewer. If you have text, it should be at the bottom of the video unless you want them to focus on only that text and nothing else. The next part is something that also has to be taken into consideration even while you're writing your script. How long can your video be? You have to think about where you're going to put your video. Now today, the time limits for this, uh, TikTok is going to push out 10 minute videos, which I think nobody's going to watch. So they have, TikTok has three minute video limits. WhatsApp, you have about three minutes before the file gets too big. Twitter has a maximum of two unless you're partnered with them. Instagram has one minute. Think about where you're putting your video and how long the video can be. Once upon a time, we had a service called Vine. It was amazing. It was seven seconds and people could still tell stories in seven seconds. It was incredible. But this is how long your video can be. You also have to ask yourself how long your video should be. I'm gonna play a quick game. I know it's a bit difficult to participate in an interactive moment right now because some of you are watching via Facebook and a non-interactive platform. So, but this, this, it still goes either way. I'm gonna show you this. Five, four, three, two, one. How many of those country names can you remember? Maybe five, you know, if you have really good memory, six, probably seven, maybe eight. In five seconds, that's all you could see. So what you have to do in understanding how long your video should be is to remember we are human beings. Our brains can only take so much information. Don't overload your viewer. If you want to talk about, if you're, let's just say you're doing a video on an invasive species in a forest, talk about one invasive species, not 15. You know, if you talk about too many, it's going to be so hard to process that. And if you're thinking about putting it on, on Instagram or Twitter, you have two minutes to talk about 15 species. You're, nobody's going to remember anything from that video. So let's go back to talking about the BBC five shot pr process. Okay. What your video should do ideally is answer just five questions, five W, one H, who, what, where, when, why, and how. If you answer these questions, you've basically told the story. You've basically told people what's going on and why it's happening, who's involved in the story, where is it happening, how did it happen, and of course, when did it happen? We're almost towards the end of this. I'm going to go into the file size next. This is something that... Um, matters if you're going to share on your messaging, messaging platforms. So all of these can affect your file size. We've already talked about resolution, aspect ratio, and length. The last one is called the bit rate. So just to recap, a resolution, less dots in the screen means low, smaller file size. Aspect ratio, um, if you have a one-to-one, -one, it'll be smaller than a 16 by nine if it's with the same uh, vertical number of pixels. The shorter the video is, the smaller the file. The last one is bit rate. And there's also frame rate and format. These are a few other things that can affect the file size. Bit rate is compression. So this is something that, uh, you know, I don't usually talk about this, 
but I'm going to touch on it quickly because I'm sure a lot of you are going to put a lot of hard work into your video. This is why you should never share video on WhatsApp and take that video as and take WhatsApp as like the format. WhatsApp will compress your video and you will see that bitrate, if, if you can see on this picture on the right, you'll see these things, they're called artifacts. They're basically the video not being able to hold enough data to store the information correctly. And you will see this on WhatsApp videos that get chain shared a lot. Like somebody shared to somebody, they download, then they share to someone else. After they share five, six times, the video looks like Chatarompa. So because of that, you have to be wary about bitrate in your videos. So some apps, especially these, we tested this out, they will compress your video down. So a 100 MB video on WhatsApp will become much smaller. Telegram, not so much. Facebook also does some level of compression. What it does is remove some detail. And if it goes down to a very low level, you can see things like this. You, because a video is trying to guess what color is here, it doesn't know, it tries to fill it in, especially in video taken at night, it'll start to look very, very bad. So how do you choose a bit rate? Ask yourself these questions. Don't worry about the math. Is my text clear? Is the sound clear? Can I see what's happening? Can I see the face clearly? And after I watch my own video, do I understand the 5W1H? Now, the next few slides are the mathematics of it. When we talk about bit rate, it's all done in numbers. So there is a use case for low bit rate, 512 kbps like this, where in places where the internet is no good. If the internet is not good, don't send big files. People will take too long to download and then they won't watch it. But if you shot very beautiful footage, go for the highest bit rate you can find. You want people to see the beauty of any footage you captured, especially if you have a very beautiful patch of forest, a very beautiful greenery, some flora and fauna that you found that is you know, breathtaking. You really want that to be highlighted, go for the highest. Frame rate is just, you know, video, as we said, it's just a series of pictures played very quickly. If you have more pictures, the video becomes smoother. But more pictures also means a bigger file. A frame rate is just basically how many pictures in one second. You may see them listed as FPS or I. 30 FPS means 30 frames in one second. 25 I means 25 interlaced frames per second. So what does this mean? I is the opposite of P. P means progressive. That means when there's a picture, the whole picture appears. When it's I, half a picture appears. And it's I will will have each line alternating. This doesn't. This is difficult to understand, but it's very easy to see. If you've ever watched an old video, you press the pause button. Have you ever seen these lines? This is interlaced video. That means only. That means there are frames, but each frame is only half. And therefore, when you press pause, you pause between two frames, and it looks like that. Most phones shoot in progressive today. We don't see uh, interlaced video in phones anymore, if I'm not mistaken. So it's something I wouldn't worry about, but something that's good to know. An ideal frame rate for your project is 20 to 30 frames per second, unless you are shooting action, unless you're shooting something like a, a, an animal that runs really fast, then you want to go up to 50 or 60, then you see it beautiful, you know, fast, smooth motion. If you go to any Harvey Norman or any like TV shop, you see them crank the frame rate very, very high because they want to show you how smooth the TV is. Now, the next part about codec is most of your phones record in MP4. And uh, codecs are basically called code encoder decoder. There's, uh, I know this is very technical, but something to bear in mind is I have to touch on this because some new phones use a format called HEVC. And HEVC is supposed to be high, it's called high efficiency video codec. It is meant to record high quality video with small space, taking up less space. The problem is a lot of old phones cannot read this and therefore cannot open the file. So if you have a problem with your phone and you can't seem to share this video with your friend, you might be recording HEVC. And what you can do is if you have, if you have a choice, find an app in your store to do a convert convert the video to mp4 and choose uh, as i mentioned as you see here h.264 this is the safe way to make a video that most phones today can play download an app do the conversion of the video and it should open on other people's phones this is a troubleshooting step that i go into because i've seen people fall into this problem especially with very new high-end phones and uh in v and vlog now we have 
the feature of changing the aspect ratio. Now, this is where things start to get very frustrating because if you've done all your work and you change your aspect ratio, it will catch out your timeline. All the work you did, you have to do it. You have to review and make sure you got it right. So this is something you should consider at the start instead of at the end. The reason why I didn't start off with this is because I wanted to go over the techniques and the basics first before going into sharing and how to upload. But in the whole you know, idea, the whole process of making video, these are some things that you should start off with in order to make sure that your end product is ready for as many devices as possible. Again, know your audience, know who's going to watch your video, know where the video is going to be and how many people you want to see the video. So remember to check your timeline. In the vlog now, the export screen looks like this. So first one, resolution. 1080p, good resolution. How many frames per second? 25 to 30 is decent. And uh, you can go for the minimum bit rate of 3.4. It's still okay. Um, it doesn't let you go lower than that for good reason. It doesn't want you to uh, send a video that's too low quality. And the result I have here after I did a recording, after I did... 10, 1080 by 1080 means that I did a square video. It is 59 seconds long and it's 10 MB, which is within limits to share on WhatsApp. I think WhatsApp has a 50 MB limit on the video file. All right, so that wraps up my uh, sharing on how to do the, uh, on how to uh, edit video. I hope that was understandable. I know it's a, it's a real crash course because this is something that took me years to learn and it's hard to teach in one sitting, but I hope I covered as much ground as possible. Thank you very much, Mr. Daniel. So we now can have a very quick Q&A because I see one question from the Q&A. So yeah, from, I, said, I hope that everyone don't mind. So from Jeremy, Jeremy Tony, is it normal uh, video to be choppy when editing? Yes, it is very normal for videos to be choppy when editing because... Again, our phones are limited and you may see more choppiness on lower end or older phones compared to newer phones. Um, your phone actually works very hard when it's video editing. Why? Your phone is trying to be a laptop during this time. You may notice your phone get hot when you're editing video on your phone because it's trying to do a lot more than it's built to do. I mean, phone basically built to take phone call, lah, but like we do, we do all sorts of things with it these days. Uh, you will notice that it behaves similarly to when you're playing games on your phone. Why? When you're playing games on your phone, your phone is trying to create video for you to see while you're playing the game. But because it's not video that you play from your phone's gallery or from a website, the game is, you cannot predict what's happening in the game, right? The phone is creating video. That's why it is working extra hard. When you're editing video, the phone doesn't know what you're going to do to the video. That's why you're, when you're editing, the phone is trying to, pre trying to show you the result of the video that you want. And it has to work extra hard for this. That's why you may see the video look choppy when editing. And when you finally export, the last step, it should be smooth. If the last step is not smooth, the problem might be with your phone being a bit old, or it could be a sign that your phone has some hardware problem or something. Uh, as much, I, I don't like to be you know, classes with phones, you know, and I, I don't like to say only people with Jangye phones can do this. I really don't like that approach because the, the idea of mobile journalism is everyone can do it. Everyone should be able to be a mobile journalist. So I, you know, I know it's frustrating to see choppy video and editing. I also don't like it. Nobody likes seeing choppy video and editing, but the result after export should be smooth. I hope that answers your question. Okay, as we are running short of time, I certain we receive a lot of knowledge from Mr. Daniel that we need more time to digest than raising the <laughs> questions. <laughs> so, thank you everyone for joining us until the very end and we have an exclusive announcement for everyone on the line. As I mentioned earlier, at the beginning of the workshop, the selected lucky winner will have a chance to experience amazing nature documentation and ecotourism with our strategic partner from Layalia, the Habitat Foundation, and Eco Eco. One selected grant a winner will be following TRCRC team to Banon Conservation Week, documenting our work in the forest while receiving a one -on one one hour mentoring session with Harun Rahman from Layalia and future 
his or her story on Eco Eco along with other amazing Asia Pacific wildlife photographer. The runner-up winner will also receive an amazing nature walk opportunity with the Habitat Foundation. For more details, stay tuned on TRCRC social media for more updates. To grab this opportunity, send us story from forests across Malaysia through the storytelling competition. It is now open for submission until March 15. We are excited to see you put Miss Pearl Mobile Photography as nail photojournalism and today Mr. Daniel Mobile Journalism skills into practice. And thank you once again to Mr. Daniel for the very detailed and comprehensive workflow on mobile journalism with a focus on videography. No it's problem. A, yeah, it's amazing to know that we can record and edit compelling video with just a limited setup. And most important, with your own mobile. You know something so, actually, uh, mm -hmm. about that today, I, and I, I'm, I'm not encouraging people to do this, but some people actually don't realize our phones have a bit of a superpower now that even some traditional journalists don't have. Some of us have phones that are waterproof. Yeah. That, that doesn't mean you should go and put your phone in the river, but <laughs> as you give to whoever wins this, you can bring your phone into the forest and you know you can go tracking with your phone, which some people don't dare to do with their 5,000 ringgit DSLR camera, but you can bring your phone into more rugged environments today than you could five, six years ago. So I hope to see you know the winner of this even continue to document their journey on their own phone to tell their own story of how, how they experienced this. And of course, to all of you watching, all the best. I wish you all the best. <laughs> Yeah, so hope that listening, leave the session with more insight and hope. So for those who miss any of the session, you can find all the recording on TRCRC YouTube channel. I, on behalf of TRCRC, thanks everyone who worked together to make this happen, especially Mr. Daniel for your time and expertise, and Yayasan Sabarabi for their support and funding. Thank you all and stay safe. Bye-bye.